Good morning. If you were expecting Carl, I'm sorry, I, not Carl, and I didn't bring a ukulele today. So you're going to have to get by without that. But we welcome all of you here in person and also online to our worship service today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you that we have the privilege of meeting together in your name. We ask your blessing upon this day, upon our lives. We know that you have great things in store for us. So we thank you for the way that you work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And now let's get ready for the lighting of the candle. And say with me the prayer. Let's all stand together and sing the first hymn this morning. to uh, time of church life and there's going to be a special message. Hmm? Sorry everyone, I had to rush down here. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing video, and I'm like, oh, I gotta get down there. Um, so, how many of you got my email? All right, so for those of you who know what we're talking about, and for those of you who do not, if you wanna know, ask your neighbor, or come to the fellowship hall after service, and we will have a wonderful time with the top secret mission. Also, I have a message for you. Carl says, give him the gospel this morning. <laughs> See you guys later. We are 
going to be going through a whole series of what Carl calls the resurrection or practice resurrection uh, services. And so uh, from now through uh, Pentecost, each service will have something to do with some kind of resurrection. Uh, you'll find mine today. Uh, and then uh, get ready also for Pentecost, which is coming up uh, May 19th. And the way that Carl has it set up is uh, David Koyumi and I will be uh, taking some of the Sundays and Carl will be sandwiching himself in between. And so prepare yourselves, fasten your seat belts if you need to, get ready for services. Um, <laughs> I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, there are several ways that you can keep in touch with us. Uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, uh, we appreciate all the ways that you contact us and keep in contact with us. There are also three ways to give. Uh, in the drop box in the back in person, you can donate by mail or you can donate online. We appreciate any way you can give us money to carry on the, the mission of this church. And so uh, you, know, you can do all three if you want to. We would appreciate it. Okay, now let's stand for Spirit of the Living God.
Thank you. You may be seated. We come now to the time of hearing the scripture. This is from John 11, verses 33 through 45. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And now we have special music.
sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes it takes a desert to get a church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, life can be hard, and we can be confused, and sometimes we can feel stuck. It is in these moments that we turn our eyes to you, to trust in you, because you have the power to help us get through whatever we're going through. Lord, sometimes we want to explain, try to figure out why things are happening, but in the end, what we need is we simply need your presence to comfort and to guide us, to give us peace that passes understanding. We don't need an explanation sometimes. What we need is you. So we turn to you, we cling to you, and in these days leading up to Pentecost, we are so thankful that you've given us your Holy Spirit so that you can be present in us and through us working in the world. Thank you. This world that we're living in is troubled right now. There's so many wars going on and they're getting worse. Worse in Gaza and Israel, worse in Ukraine, and ongoing in Sudan and ongoing other parts of the world. So many conflicts. Father God, we just pray that there could be a peaceful resolution to all these conflicts. I know that everyone wants to be the winner, but in the end, no one wins in these wars. So we pray that you would bring peace to this world. And we continue to lift up all the problems that we have um, going on in our own lives. Um, there are quite a few health prayers that we want to lift up. Father God, we just want to pray for our dear Pastor Carl and his chemotherapy treatments. We pray that you would be with the doctors, that you would grant them wisdom so that they could do the treatment well and that these treatments would be successful. Father God, we want to pray for uh, Peggy Nabs 
chemotherapy treatments, we pray that these treatments would also be successful as well. We pray for Meredith Johnson, who will be undergoing surgery tomorrow. May you grant the doctors and surgeons wisdom and skill in going through the procedure. We pray for Jerry Reynolds' chemotherapy treatments. We ask that they would be successful, that they would put a stop um, to, to his sickness and help him to get better. And we are so thankful that you've brought Nina back uh, so that she could be with us. And we pray for continued recovery from, for her after her surgery. Father God, we want to lift up Carl Frederick, who just had a surgery on his foot this morning. We pray for his recovery. We pray for Jan Sedino and for her continued healing after her knee replacement surgery. We want to lift up Hong's dad's recovery from his surgery, and we pray that he would make a speedy recovery and regain full health. We pray for David Saviel's dental health. Uh, may you help his teeth to feel better. And we pray for David Lin's back. May you help his uh, back to, to heal from the sciatica pain and that he would be recovered. And we pray for Vicky's foot to be healed after a chair fell and hit her foot. And we also want to thank you uh, that Richard can rejoin us, continue to be with him as he uh, recovers and regains strength and puts on weight so he can be healthy and strong. And pray, uh, actually, a big thank you for marrying, being able to see her granddaughter after nine years. Thank you so much for that chance to uh, be reunited and to see her granddaughter. And we want to close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, David. You know, as we enter this time of spring, uh, those of us who grew up or around farms start getting this inner urge to go plant something. That's in us. It's inborn. We've seen the dark winter with dead trees and the dead ground all around. But spring brings the promise of the resurrection of the earth. Dead things begin to show signs of life. Trees sprout leaves and then blossoms. Seeds that are planted in the ground begin to grow and show signs of greenness. Life is being refreshed. And so it's really very appropriate that we look at this story of the resurrection and rebirth today, the resurrection of Lazarus. As we look into the story about how Jesus restored a man's life to him, we also need to be looking at what does the story mean for us here today? In order to uh, understand the entire story, uh, you have to read the entire 11th chapter of John and part of the 12th. So that's your homework assignment after you leave here today. I am a teacher after all. This event leads directly to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the resurrection of Lazarus is tied to the resurrection of Jesus. And at the same time, the resurrection of Lazarus affirms for us the truth about the person of Jesus Christ, who is the savior of us all. Basically, the story is that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha uh, are dear friends with Jesus. And we've seen them before in various places in the Bible, in the life of Jesus. But when Lazarus, the brother, falls sick, uh, his sisters contact Jesus. Jesus is, uh, has left the area of Judea 
and gone north uh, because of threats against his life. The Jewish leaders have said that if Jesus returns to Judea, he's to be arrested and he also may be stoned to death. So the sisters let Jesus know that their brother is seriously ill, but implicit in their request that he, he come to heal Lazarus, as they know that since Jesus has a history of healing other people with illnesses, that if he comes there, he can heal Lazarus as well. But the strange thing is when Jesus hears this, he doesn't immediately say, drop everything and let's go to Lazarus. What he says is, let's stay here for another two days. And his disciples are kind of confused about that because they know of his deep friendship with Lazarus and the sisters. And they, they, they want to know why he isn't rushing to his friend's side. What Jesus tells them is God is going to do something very special through Lazarus. But then two days later when Jesus does say, okay, it's time to go visit Lazarus, the disciples then say, well, why are we going back there? If you go back there, you're going to get killed. They remind him of the danger, not only to his life, but to theirs as well. And in this story, I love the reaction of Thomas, who is what I call the Eeyore of the disciples. <laughs> well, if he's going to go back there and get himself killed, we might as well go with him and die with him too. <laughs> Jesus' reasoning, of course, is that what he's going to do will convince his disciples once and for all that he really and truly is who he has been saying that he is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He will prove not only to them but also to the world that God acting through him has the power over the forces of evil and even over the forces of death itself. So Jesus goes back to Bethany, which is in Judea. That's where his friends lived. But what he finds when he gets back is Lazarus has already been dead for four days. And I thought, why did they put that? Why didn't they just say he was dead? Well, I found out this is an important bit of information because in doing research for the service today, I found that one of the traditions or beliefs at the time among the Jewish uh, people there was they believed that the soul hovered around the dead body for three days, waiting for it to be reunited with the body. And after three days, if the soul wasn't reunited with the body, then they let, the soul left because there was no way that it then could be reunited with the body. And so, you know, four days then becomes very important. Everybody would know the soul has left. There's no way that Lazarus can be resurrected. Now, also, the reaction of the two sisters is very different. When Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she runs out to meet him. And I'm not going to run up and down the aisle like <laughs> Carl did for showing us the father running. Our sister Mary, however, stays at home because she's in mourning. So when Martha meets Jesus, the first thing she says to him is, Jesus, if you come earlier, my brother would have been saved. You would have been able to heal him and he would be alive. Notes that she does believe that Jesus can work miracles of healing, but now that he's dead, that miracle is beyond happening. Since Lazarus is dead, Jesus can't do anything. What Jesus tells her is, no, Lazarus is going to live again. 
And Martha doesn't quite understand what he's talking about there because when she hears that Lazarus is going to hear again, she says, yeah, we know he is. He'll live again when all dead souls rise again on the last day. But what Jesus says is something very, very different. He tells her that he is the resurrection and the life, not the future. He is the resurrection and the life. In fact, his words are, the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. If we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we have the promise of eternal life. Jesus is the one who connects us with God. When we truly believe that he is the promised Messiah, when we truly believe that he is the Savior who was promised throughout the Bible, then we are promised that we will be able to live with him forever. This is the faith to which we are called by word and by the Spirit. Jesus, the Christ, is indeed Lord of our lives. And yes, we know we're going to transform from this physical life that we now live on earth, but the life to which we're going to transform is going to be a life of glory. And the reason we know that is because of what Jesus is going to do with Lazarus. In a way, by bringing Lazarus back to life, he's giving us a glimpse into the glorious future that we all are going to be able to share in being brought back to life. Only when we pass from existence on this earth in our physical form, we're going to eternal life. Lazarus, unfortunately, is just coming back to life on earth. Now Martha shows her faith when she tells him that she really does believe that he is the Messiah. And then she leaves him and she goes home to tell her sister Mary that the teacher has come. Notice she calls him the teacher. This is an important statement too because under the society of the time, women would never have been allowed to be in the presence of someone who does religious teachings. Rabbis or teachers taught men only. Women were never allowed to be there. And yet when we read the stories about Jesus preaching throughout the life of Jesus, we see that there were families. We see that there not only were men, but also women. And in fact, in some of the verses, it says there were so many people there and there were women and children as well. What Jesus did was allow women to be present when he was teaching because that's very important. Jesus allowed women who were not respected in the world at their time to be raised to a level of respect and honor. They could not only hear his message, but they could be transformed on their own. They weren't transformed because of somebody else. Jesus elevated the status of women from the way they were treated at the time to the status of where they should be. Now, Martha's sister Mary, as we said, had stayed at home. She's still in mourning. And there are a number that are gathered around her who are also joining in the morning. Uh, one of the memories that I have when I was growing up is when a person died in our community, there were a whole group of people who would come in. The men would come in to do the outside work. The women would come in to do the household work so that the family could mourn. And very often, you know, they would bring food and take over for several days so that the family only had to pay attention to the death, the mourning, 
and a time to adjust. And whenever the people are in the house and they're mourning, there would be probably a lot of noise. There's going to be crying. There's going to be wailing. There's going to be loud noises. And one of the interesting things is that the more important the person, the longer the wailing was supposed to go on and the larger the number of mourners you had. And in the Middle Ages especially, very often what people who were very wealthy would do is they would hire hundreds of people to come and wail. You know, so it's like, let's suppose somebody down the street died and they came in and said, okay, everybody in this church is going to get $100 to come and just wail for an hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could make money. <laughs> At any rate, Mary leaves her seat of mourning and she gets up to go see Jesus. And the crowd follows, you know, where your mourner goes, you're going to go with them. And interesting enough, she says the same thing that her sister said. Jesus, if you'd been here earlier, her brother would not have died. She also believes that he could have saved Lazarus had he been there. But now that Lazarus is dead, there's no hope. And so he should join in the mourning uh, for their brother. And Jesus sees the deep sorrow that they have, and he's moved. And we're, we're given the, that shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept for the loss of Lazarus. He wept because of the, the mourning that was going on. But also we're told that what he uttered was not just a cry, but it was a cry of anger, a cry of anger that was directed at sin and death itself. Then he asked where they buried Lazarus, and they take him to the cave where Lazarus is born, or is buried. And according to the story that we read, at this time, some of the people are very upset with Jesus, and they're saying, look, this man heals the blind. Why couldn't he heal his friend? They know that Jesus could have healed Lazarus even from a distance. He didn't have to be there in person. But Jesus ignores them. He directs them to take away the stone from the tomb. And... Again, you know, remember in the story of Jesus, the stone is rolled away as well. However, Martha, not understanding, says, I know, Jesus, you don't want to roll away the stone. You roll away the stone, the odor's going to come out. He's been dead for four years. He's decomposing. And, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever been around the decaying body of a dead animal. Sometimes they end up in our yard. Sometimes they end up on the roadside. But the odor of a decaying animal is not a pleasant smell. And the, I'm uh, told that the smell of a human who is decaying is a hundred times worse than that of an animal. But Jesus says, no, roll away the stone. You're going to see something wonderful that the glory of God is going to do if you simply believe and obey. Now, those are important words to them. Those are important words to us as well. You've heard the words trust and obey. Those are the important words for us to follow today. Trust Jesus, obey Jesus. And so the people listen and they roll away the stone. Now, first thing Jesus does when they roll away the stone is he doesn't give a command, he prays to God. 
the glory is not going to be Jesus' glory. The glory, the credit, is going to go to God. That's very, very important because when healing takes place, it isn't because of anything that we do or anything that we cause to happen. The healing comes from God. And it comes to, from God in response to our prayers, our petitions. Whenever God grants our petitions, we also should respond with the words, to God be the glory. We should never take credit for the healing ourselves. We are incapable of causing healing. Doctors, nurses, anybody, the healing comes from God. Okay, so now the stage is set. Tomb is open. Stone is rolled away. Jesus doesn't go into the tomb and bring him out. Jesus stands outside and he says, Jesus, or Lazarus, come forth. I'm sure that the sisters there, if you're going to do something about it, why don't you go inside? If you go in and touch him, maybe you can do something. But Jesus doesn't. He stands outside and he calls for Lazarus. It's important. When Jesus calls us, then our duty, our blessing, is to respond to his voice. And of course, to the surprise of everybody, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. He's still wrapped in the bindings in which he would have been wrapped when, when he was laid in the tomb. And what Jesus says is, take those wrappings off him. One interesting note is, Lazarus comes out of the tomb wrapped up in the, clo the clothing that he still had uh, when he was buried. When Jesus was resurrected, the wrappings were left behind. Lazarus is coming because he is being brought back to life on this earth. When Jesus is resurrected, he goes to heaven. Jesus isn't going to need wrapping clothes again for death. And I've often wondered what Lazarus, or Lazarus may have thought. Oh, he resurrected me, he brought me back to life. Eh, I'm going to have to die again sometime. So, but the other thing that we can understand too is when Lazarus comes out, he's totally healed. There is no decay. And we can find that out because if we read the first verses in chapter 12, we find out that Jesus goes back to uh, them for a meal later on. And Lazarus is one of the guests there at the uh, meal. And he's identified as the one who was dead and brought back to life. So after Jesus resurrects Lazarus, he goes on with life just like he did before. Now, because the people there see this miracle, many of them are able to believe in the person of Jesus. They become his followers. They see that this man truly is the Son of God. This man truly is who he says he is and who others say that he is. And we're told that there were many people who were converted because they see Lazarus brought back to life. But we're also reminded of the words of Jesus from John chapter 20, verses 28 and 29, when old Thomas, old Eeyore Thomas, the doubter, says, I don't believe in the resurrected Christ until I see the wounds from his crucifixion. And Jesus eventually tells him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Those are, you know, us. We don't have to see a miracle that Jesus is performing. 
We see the words of others, we hear the testimony, and we are called to believe because of the word and because of the spirit. Now this story, which is so familiar to us in so many ways, is loaded with items that should strengthen our faith and knowledge that Jesus was and he is who he said he was. He really and truly is the Messiah. He really and truly is the promised one. He really is the one who came to die on the cross so that our sins might be pardoned. He's the one who paid the ransom for the judgment that every one of us deserves, whether we believe that or not. The resurrection of Lazarus points the way to our own transition from this life to the next, not to flesh and blood here on earth as Lazarus did, but to that eternal life which we're told about. What is important for us here and now is just like Mary and Martha, we believe that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. That's very important. We have to believe that God sent Jesus into the world not only to teach us about the character and the purpose of God, but also that God's purpose was to send Jesus to the cross, to become the suffering servant, that he was to shed his blood to cover our sins, that we are saved because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And whenever we accept that and we understand that, then we begin to have an understanding of what faith is and what faith can be. The resurrected Jesus is what we believe in. Our cross represents Jesus' resurrection. Yes, we celebrate the birth and the life and the death of Jesus, but just as important as the resurrection. Without Jesus' resurrection, we have no future. The resurrection of Lazarus points us to the resurrection of Jesus. And as Pastor Carl would say, he brings us to that already, but not yet. Resurrected lives means rebirth. We undergo a transformation when we respond to the call that Jesus makes to us. And when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we are resurrected from our human existence to existence under salvation through Jesus Christ. Yesterday, David Kayumi and I were talking and he gave me this idea. Jesus calls us, and when he calls us, we come from the tomb of sin into new life. We throw off the wrappings of evil and death in order to live lives as resurrected people under the guidance of Jesus Christ. When we accept Jesus, we're resurrected into a new being. It means that we leave the old self behind. We strive to live for Jesus in everything that we do. You know, we're called to be forgiving of others with no conditions set. And that's hard. I often want to say, I forgive you if you do the following, or if you respond in the certain ways, but I'm going to hold my forgiveness until you do that. Think about what would happen if God did us that way. Oh, Bob, I'm going to forgive you if you do A, B, and C. I probably would still be on hold from sins I committed in 1945. We're called to be of service to others rather than demanding that others recognize our own importance or status. 
Jesus called us to be servants. He didn't call us to be kings. We're called to be a community of believers wrapped in love for each other and helping each other. We're called to be faithful, but not just being faithful, but to live in that faith so that when others see us, they're going to look at us and say, I want to be like that. When we act through our faith, others can be led to Jesus. We need to pray for each other ceaselessly because there really is power in the selfless prayers of believers. We've seen many examples of people praying for somebody and those prayers are answered. But we also have to remember God answers in his way and in his time. I can't give God a timetable when I give him my prayers. God, I want you to do this, and I want it done by Thursday at 3 o'clock. God just says, yeah, right. And above all, resurrection of the Spirit means every one of us should be filled with joy, joy, joy. That should be every breath. I don't know, some of you, I can remember in some churches singing the song, I have joy joy, joy, down in my heart. No, we should be shouting it. And we should probably do it with ukuleles. <laughs> yep. And when we live our lives as true believers, dedicated by our faith to all of God's creation, then we can truly look forward to one day being just as Lazarus was, lifted up from the portals of death into true life itself, life with the eternal flock under the care of our good shepherd who loved us enough to give up his life for us and to prove that death could never contain him. We can be assured that Jesus is in glory because he showed us by raising Lazarus that he, Jesus Christ, through God, is the victor over death itself. Jesus Christ, who was and who is and who ever shall be. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for the story that you've given us about the raising of Lazarus. We thank you that you acted through your servant Jesus Christ to show that you are more powerful than death itself and to give us the promise of eternal life through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus. And we are eternally grateful, Heavenly Father, that you have called us all together as your family, that we may worship together and pray together, that we may serve each other in love that mirrors the love that you have shown to us. And it is in the name of the risen Christ and the risen Lazarus, that we're reminded of your love. And in the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, let's stand and sing our final hymn. Hey, boy, hey,
whom they go, but the resurrected Jesus Christ, go in his blessing Amen. and carry the church with you. And now let's all sing our sending song. May the peace of Christ go with Lazarus, go in peace. And all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. God's blessing as well, Paul. 